Hi, everyone. Welcome to Heavy Girls Podcast, provided to you by Black Girls World Zine. Black Girls World Zine is a magazine dedicated to black women and women of color who are passionate about alternative music, metal music, and really just any kind of experimental crazy music um, that you might not expect us to be interested in. And today we have with us um, my sister who is the senior editor of black girls world zine and daphne brooks all right hi it's courtney senior editor of black girls world and i'm so excited to interview with daphne brooks hope everybody's having a good summer so far staying masked up if you need to get that vaccine if you can Christina and Courtney, it is such a pleasure and an honor to be with you all today. And it is inspiring and moving the conversations that you are um, generating in our world right now. So thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it, Daphne. Daphne, I love the book. It oh, was 600 you. pages of I know. Don't scare people away. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think what I loved about it the most was your personality came through through the whole book. I knew it was you. And I was really, I just thought it was so cool that just like a record, you broke it into side A and side B. So um, for the podcast today, we're going to break it into side A, which is Christina. She's kind of going to do like a slice of you in the scene and what it was like for you listening to music. And then sign B, we're going to go through this book with me. So. I love it. I love it. Let's do it. <laughs> so Daphne, could you tell us a little bit about how you first became interested in Black women musicians? Yeah, so I'm a native of the San Francisco Bay Area. And I always like to say my love of music comes from being the youngest in a much older family. So my parents were were, uh, slow in having their kids. We were spaced very far apart. I have a brother who's 17 years older than me and a sister who's 10 years older than me. And my parents had me in their 40s, which is much more common now than it was in the late 1960s. And so I'm sometimes referred to as a menopause baby. (laughs) They weren't (laughs) expecting me. But all of that's really important. I think it's always important um, as we come into consciousness with regards to our cultural likes and dislikes, how we develop our taste. And my tastes were developed by being immersed in a household that had these kind of stratified generational sounds you know my parents were listening to count basie and duke ellington and um my mother became very passionate about the spinners um and al green in the early to mid 70s when i was a wee little baby and um my brother was listening to the temptations and my sister was listening to that kind of you know, youth sounds of the Jackson Five, but also um, in the context of the civil rights movement and um, cultural integration. Um, My sister in particular started attending schools where she was picking up the sounds of Barbara Streisand and Barry Manilow. And so all of that I'm getting, right? Um, My parents had migrated from uh, from Texas and Arkansas as part of the, the Great Migration um, to Northern California. And originally they were based in Berkeley and Oakland and then moved down to Menlo Park in Palo Alto where I was born. So all of those kinds of regional influences were also informing the sounds that I was hearing. But I in particular as a Gen X baby ended up going to school again with you know integrated populations of kids who were listening to lots of different sounds and I I loved everything from the clash to Tina Turner, but I really understood myself as being in conversation with those black women artists like Grace Jones. um, And, um, you know, a whole range of other kind of on the cusp new wave punk punk rock artists Annabella from Bow Wow Wow. Um, you know, um, 
but that was always kind of at the foundation and the core of why I felt music was so crucial to, you know, having a voice in, in, in culture, um, in American culture and in American culture, um, that did not see fit, fit to acknowledge the visibility, the legibility and the contributions of, of black women, um, musicians and thinkers. Did you ever make any music yourself? Like, did you play an instrument when you were a kid? I was a terrible musician. Thanks for asking, <laughs> Christina. I mean, like many um, Black children of a particular generation, I had um, piano lessons, clarinet lessons as well. This was, again, following in the footsteps of um, my my big sister, who was like an idol to me. You know, she was the one who was hosting Soul Train, you know, dance parties in her bedroom every Saturday afternoon. Oh, wow. So I picked up the piano as well. Um, but I, I didn't really stick with those things. I became much more interested in trying to get close to the music by writing about it um, and having conversations with the music through writing. My other great passion, again, handed down to me from my sister was Black feminist literature. And I was lucky enough to have been born in um, you know, the run of the Black feminist literary rena renaissance of the 1970s. So I was born in mm -hmm. 1968. And um, my sister, by the time she was going to college, was um, reading Toni Morrison and Alice Walker and Intisaki Shange, and she was bringing all of those voices home to me. So I was consuming that literature and thinking about how important writing was as um, a political act and as a creative act. And somehow there was a way that I thought um, one could merge a passion for literature with a passion for music. So yeah. again, kind of awful when it came to playing things, but felt that I could maybe play along through writing. I like that you pointed out you were reading Toni Morrison and Maya Angelou and Alice Walker and everybody for yeah. fun. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, I mean, you know, I wouldn't be the first to say that that was like nourishment, you know, to our spirits. Um, and, and for me, again, you know, for all of us, it was about being able to imagine worlds in which we were the center, you know, of those um, publics that we mm -hmm. that our consciousness was regarded as being something to be valued and taken seriously and a part of our world making practices. Um, and so I really saw a resonance between you know, the literature that I was reading way too young. I mean, those books are heavy. Mm -hmm. if, you know, people know, of course, Tony's first book, Professor Morrison, as I should call her. And I did have the honor and privilege of being able to um, be on faculty with her at Princeton University before she retired. But, um, you know, Professor Morrison's first book, The Bluest Eye is, you know, heavy duty material. And yet it was, it was something that as, um, as complicated and challenging as it was to read, when I was, you know, I think it was when I was in junior high, when I first encountered that book, it was also um, a kind of confirmation that um, there was another way of inhabiting the world and also critiquing the world since that's a deeply traumatic book. But it is a book that as I teach in, in my classes, um, it does have hope and, and that that's crucial. And that's also why black music is so powerful, right? Because it, it, it generates a kind of philosophy of hope just in its existence. And so, again, that's why I, I, I was drawn to the study of both the literature and the music, y'all. <laughs> no, that makes sense. I was, um, I spent most of my youth in classical violin. I was like a competitive wow. violinist and um, didn't get exposed to a lot of Black authors until much later. But yeah, to yeah. your point about writing about music, one of the authors I found in my youth was Anne Rice. And it was the first time I had picked up a book where mm -hmm. I felt like she was so descriptive in her writing, I could hear the music, you know? Yeah. And oh, I just that's thought great. that was so interesting of, mm -hmm. oh, like, you can actually use words and language to describe something you've never heard of um, yes. and still get pretty close. <laughs> to yeah, that. no, absolutely. I mean, and in the book, I write about the great Zora Neale Hurston, who mm -hmm. was rediscovered and, and, you know, 
um, brought back into our consciousness by Alice Walker in the 1970s. I mean, she, she died in an unmarked grave after having been one of the most famous and influential artists of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, but she was also, she was also an, an anthropologist and an ethnographer of black sound. Um, she would go out into the field in, um, so to speak, in the anthropological um, ways in which we, we, you know, describe what it's like to do that study, but to go out into the field in Florida, in Haiti, I mean, other, other parts of the global south, and she's trying to pick up the sounds of a people, but she also wrote about those sounds. And um, I, I, you know, I, I just think that there's something incredibly powerful about being able to approximate the experience that one has relating to music um and to place a value on it and mm -hmm. we know that historically you know even though black peoples have massively contributed to um you know western ideas about music um have broken through um all sorts of barriers in terms of artistic innovation by way of music um the history of 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 their work being valued um, by the writers who then tell you what to like and what not to like, mm -hmm. what to take seriously and what not to take seriously, um, that that particular kind of practice um, ha has always um, put Black folks at the, at the bottom of, of the list of um, what should be cared for and what should be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the main reasons why I wanted to write the book. I have a bit of a fun question. There's this one photograph that um, has, it's been cir circulating online for a while now, but it's an old photo of Hazel Scott and Billie Holiday in conversation. I think it's someone's Harlem apartment or something. And I was wondering if you had, wow, <laughs> if you had a moment in history um, where you, you wish you could have been there because I think it's, it's a picture for me where I'm like ooh, to be a fly on the wall in that movie. oh my god I mean first of all Christina that I mean thank you for bringing up that photo which I've never seen I have oh, to I'll google that to yeah. right now so that's that's absolutely amazing mm -hmm. um and what a great question that no one has asked me and I have a million different ways that I would answer the question, but I think the first thing that comes to mind is imagining, um, you know, the moments at which Lorraine Hansberry and Nina Simone were sitting around talking about Marx with each other, which, wow. which Nina Simone famously talks about, you know, the, oh, we just were engaging in girl talk, you know, Marx and Lenin, which was her sly way of reminding us, you know, that you know, black women can have these robust um, conversations about political theory and liberation, and that you know those conversations have been unfolding, you know, outside of standard-bearing histories since the beginning of of Western quote unquote time. Um, to be in the room with them, just talking about their ideas, creative, political, about black uplift, just would have been absolutely extraordinary. You know, that's um, awesome. Daphne, you were already an accomplished writer before your latest work, which is, I'm going to hold it up, even though it's bad. <laughs> Liner notes for the revolution, the intellectual life of Black feminist sound. This came out in February 2021, it, uh, for all our listeners who aren't aware. Um, it's available wherever books are sold. Um, and that was its book birthday. And I feel like that should be a mark in history, like a celebration of life, mm. because it feels to me almost like a history book that everybody needs to have on their shelf and just like read a chapter every day. Um, I felt like I learned so much more about the artists I was casually, casually following. It made me feel lazy <laughs> or I'm just like, <laughs> why aren't I reading the liner notes and things from, from these people that I call my, I'm their biggest fan. Mm. And I didn't know they had such depth to them. So mm. thank you so much for shining a light on these artists, the way they need to be. Um, this has just been great. Um, for our listeners, I did just want to define and definitely correct me if I'm wrong, what a liner note is. They are the writings found on the sleeves of LP record albums or inside of CDs. 
And I have, I, you know, Janelle Mode is one of my favorite artists. I did not know she had liner notes. I need to find them. Yes. <laughs> I need yes, to read them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's um, it's it's incredible. Um, thank you for providing that definition to our listeners of what liner notes are, and it's not surprising at all that you wouldn't know that um, she's um, authored them in collaboration with her incredible Wonderland Wonderland Arts Collective, um, you know, partners partners in crime, so to speak, you know, brilliant black fugitive crime. Um, because of the fact that we, the material object of the record is something that, of course, is much more elusive now um, in our public culture because of the rise of digital streaming in the 21st century. But um, in the 20th century and when I was growing up, you know, to spend time at record stores and to linger, you know, um, in the record bins, um, paying attention to album covers, but also sometimes the liner notes could be printed on the backs of albums. Historically, as we were just pointing out, they were on the sleeves of the of the albums, right? So the the paper that enshrouds the the vinyl, um, you'd pull it out, and there'd be you know this beautiful essay that could be written by um, a, a critic that the musician had selected or that the label had selected. Sometimes the artists themselves, like John Coltrane, Frank Zappa, Sun Ra, um, just you know, wrote these extraordinarily experimental notes that were kind of like little Easter egg, you know, um, narrative extensions of whatever the concept of the album was, and um, you know, Janelle Monet and Chuck Lightning and Nate Wonder and Roman G and Arthur. Um, you know, all these folks that have been working with her for so long in Atlanta, in Hotlanta, um, they are really students of Black studies, but also students of um, the LP. And um, if you have either the vinyl or the CD versions of the Arc Android and um, Metropolis, the, you know, landmark EP that burst her on the scene, um, even the Electric Lady, um, you will find these just you know dazzlingly provocative like streams of poetry that accompany each track of um um on the album and i you know i i encourage people to seek them out because they really do give you a sense of the broader um you know absolutely electrifying intellectual world and historical and socio-political world in which um, Ms. Monet um, situates um, her sounds, you know. Um, it's one of the reasons why I really wanted to pay tribute to that tradition through the title of the book was to, to really get us to think about the ways that our, our great Black feminist thinkers, whether they're the musicians themselves or um, the writers like Lorraine Hansberry who loved the culture, um, were really devoting themselves to trying to write alongside the music um, to give us that kind of extension of the world of the music through writing. Yeah, it just it just felt I felt like your book let me see another side to her. I already loved her for her creative genius. I love the Wonderland um, whole team for like the art I was seeing in the music videos and stuff. But to see and like really see she's so freaking smart like, and creative in so many other ways it was just like wow like i just feel like um your book is just showing there's so many different facets or faces of an artist that it, that can exist at the same point in time that like you're saying she's actively making tongue-in-cheek references to political commentary and things like that it's like what even within the lines of the songs i'm just like yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, you know, the lines where you get in um in her notes these allusions to songs that approximate the kind of the feeling and the imagery of the the burning plantation house in Django Unchained. I mean, that's a kind of, you know, literary and visual culture lyricism that reminds us that she is inviting us to think about the music as multi-sensory, multi-dimensional, trans-historical. Um, you know, and that's a that's a that's a project that we can see across generations of black women artists and critics who cared about black women artists 
were interested in giving us the bigger life worlds of the music. What black female artist right now has caught your ear recently? Like, who are you listening to right now to get you through this summer? Oh my gosh, I love that question as well, and it's always changing. Uh, Yola's got a new album that's that's coming out. I'm very excited about her, our our black British country rock sister. Um, you know, I think she's really doing exciting things that have been compelling and moving to me. Um, Brittany Howard's Jamie is still one of my favorite records of the past few years. And I think today there's a, a, a tribute album to Jamie that just dropped that finds people like Childish Gambino, you know, covering Stay High, you know, so um, excited about that. Um, I, Jamila Woods is um, someone I write a little bit about in the book, um, her um, Legacy Legacy album dropped right as I was finishing um, finishing liner notes for the revolution. And so I've said to her in my my conversation that I did with her for art form, oh my God, I could have I could have written a whole book just about legacy legacy. So I was excited to to be able to get that into um, get that into the book. And it's it's an album, you know, in which she's she's really like thinking through the symbolism and richness of figures like Zora and Eartha Kitt um, and Tasaki Shange. She names a number of tracks on the album after these icons, um, Baldwin and Basquiat as well. She's incredible, Jamila Woods. I will I will add to um, just as a, a little um, a little twist that I, I'm a big St. Vincent fan and um, she is not an African-American artist, um, but her engagement with um, with Nina Simone and um, a variety of other kind of iconic figures, prints um, who have shaped her avant-gardism um, have brought me back to her music um, um, quite a bit. And I'm really loving her album, Daddy's Home. That's, a, that's another jam that I have on repeat play this summer. So those are the so those are the immediate ones that come to mind, but I feel like that's that's it's always changing. Be with me here at the table in this place, down in the collection box with gloves off, holding the withered photograph, the dog-eared pamphlet the crumbling letter, the fragile diary. Be with me, huddling, squinting, pouring over precious materials, back aching, neck spasming, knees stiffening. Our bodies sitting here at the cool, sleek, institutional desk carry what others have given up. Together, we labor in the archive and we ask questions. How did it feel? What did they want? Why did they go rather than where? As we still yet respect their right to disappear. That's page 262. Mm. I love that. Mm. <laughs> that for me is the book. I want to break that down. So let's, okay. we're going to take Well, you, you know, I just want to <laughs> say that, you know, all thanks to the great Sadia Hartman, um, MacArthur Genius Fellow, uh, professor of uh, African-American studies and literature and women's and gender and sexuality studies at Columbia University. Her book, Wayward, Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, was such a huge influence on my thinking and, and her scholarship, you know, across many studies. Um, she had been working on that book for many years um, leading up to its publication in Oh my gosh, when would that have been now? Um, winter of 2019, would it be? Um, and I was invited to be a part of a faculty salon um, celebrating the book. But, you know, a lot of her research um, focuses on, you know, trying to think intimately about Black women's lives, what their lives were up close, you know, um, in in um, the context of their relationships and their um, kind of, she gives us a kind of cartography of their desires, so kind of a map of how they're living their lives through their desires and their wants and needs. And um, some of what you 
um, read Courtney came from my tribute to Sadia Hartman's work and during that salon that became a part of the opening of the second half of, of my book. Um, but she really gave me the courage to put into language what it means to do. And again, thank you for talking about labor or like what it means to do the labor of you know, looking for our our elders who left behind few traces of themselves, not because necessarily they didn't want to, although they may not have wanted to, right? But because mm -hmm. also of the ways that power does not, um, systemic um, structures of power does, do not enable us to, to know them in the ways that um, dominant culture, um, you know, um, elevates, the historical worth of um you know people who hold the reins to institutions of cultural memory um mm -hmm. so she really gave me the courage to ask you know how is it that we can think in different ways about what black women and girls lives were like in the early to mid 20th century and how did music help to make the difference in how they came to know themselves in that history. Yeah, I think that goes back to that hope you keep talking about where it's, mm -hmm. there was a hope there, even yeah. when things were difficult and things are still difficult. There was, there's still this everlasting hope that you can see through the music. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And I do write about in the book, my 95 year old mother, who is knock on wood, still doing her thing out in the San Francisco Bay Area. And it was um, upon the occasion of her 90th birthday when as the academic of the family, I was asked to do an oral history with her. And she started talking about how she went to record stores all the time in Jim Crow, Texas in the early 1940s when she was a teenager. And I thought back to when I was dyeing my hair and climbing out the window, going, going to see the bad brains in high school and how my parents, my late dad and my mom were like, we don't understand this child. And I thought, and I'd spend all my time at Tower Records, you know, on the weekends. And I thought, wait, this same woman who gave me so much, you know, business <laughs> about what I was doing on the weekends had her own weekends. Uh -huh. And um, it made me want to know more and to just kind of to honor, to honor that generation um, that was you know getting their life on in spite of um the anti-blackness of american culture that suggested that they had no life mm -hmm. yeah i think me and christina talk about that a lot um in our magazines this feeling like our parents just didn't understand how we <laughs> yes. like metal but they still dropped us off at the concert We're like, exactly. an hour. i know i know i know <laughs> one of my one of my my most mem the memories that makes me the most verklempt, as, as our Yiddish friends like to say, is when my parents took me after I just harangued them again and again and again um, to take me to see the police, the band, the new wave band, not the, the state surveillance, you know, infrastructure that is bearing down on black people's lives, but the band, um, mm -hmm. which I loved, and they were opening for Santana at the California State Fair. And um, that was in Sacramento, you know, which is an hour and a half away from Palo Alto. They drove me up to that show with one of my friends. And when we came out of um, the gig, my parents were asleep with their heads on each other's shoulders on a, on a bench at the state fair. And it's Aww. just it's something that I still get kind of teary thinking about, you know. Yeah, so That's nice. let's hear it for the parents getting us to the shows, right? <laughs> yeah, they were always supportive of the rock music because they they legit didn't know what it was or what it right. meant, but they That's really right. didn't like rap music or hip hop. So, mm -hmm. like, if we played that at home, it was like turn that mess off, right. and we yes. turn on yes. the rock, and they're like, I don't even know what that is. I guess continue. <laughs> continue i don't know what that is Still right that i'm not sure of so <laughs> let's li just leave that alone but the rap yeah i know yeah 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 they yeah. used to send me to uh inner city camps in detroit we were in the suburbs you didn't see a lot of black kids we're like we're gonna bus you 
that's where the black people are. Make sure yes. you get that culture. I yes. don't think they knew what that meant. So I came back with all the rap albums going, I know Lil John, Lil Wayne, and they were oh like, no, bring it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know it's funny because, you know, the uh, music is our, our, our kind of the language in which we speak ourselves um, in, mm -hmm. in youth culture. And it, it can be both, you know, a bridge and a barrier in our relationships with our parents or even our older siblings. Like in my case, my, my older siblings did not understand when I fell in love with new wave and punk rock, like what was going on. Um, but it is the way that we kind of explore and experiment with, you know, all of the things that all of our passions and our everyday desires. And, you know, what I'm hearing is a similarity in terms of having you know, generous and loving parents who wanted to both connect us to black peoples, make sure that was sustainable, which was also challenging for me in, in Palo Alto, which was incredibly segregated, um, but also giving us the room to kind of, you know, to be free. You know, so my folks were dropping me off at shows all the time. There was a YouTube show at the Cow Palace where we were, it was so crowded at the front of the stage that people lost their shoes. And you oh, know, black man. parents don't play. If you're gonna lose your shoes, ooh, I got it that night. And I was like, but everybody was doing it. Oh my God. Like, well, everybody ain't you. So you need to not be rolling up on that. Yeah. <laughs> come in, come out with everything you came in there with. Okay, exactly, exactly. Exactly. What a hilarious. Mm -hmm. So I want to take it back to the quote a little bit. How did you like, how did you keep going? How were you able to stay the course down in the archives and things like that? Like mm -hmm. what what kept you going and digging, you know, following mm -hmm. up the leads? Yeah. Thanks for that question. You know, I a lot of it was about the kind of feeling that just got cultivated when you spend long periods of times time in you know other people's material records of being so yes. lorraine hansberry's archives um which are archival papers which are extensive i mean just boxes and boxes and boxes of you know notes and drafts of many many drafts of of um, articles and lectures she was giving and plays like early early drafts of plays and um, also a, a you know a huge just bin of fan letters because she was just a legit celebrity when she broke on the scene in 1959 with um, her landmark play A Raisin in the Sun and she becomes you know the youngest playwright um, and the first African-American playwright to break through many different barriers on Broadway in 1959. And, and as a result, there were this, this cross section of both, you know, um, young African-American activists, people like um, Ernest Green of the Little Rock Nine, you know, the famous um, group of young people who integrated um, um, Little Rock High, Central High, um, at, at one of the, the, the watershed moments and the um, turning points in the early days of the modern civil rights movement. Um, he wrote a fan letter to her, like, oh my God, I could, I could see Walter Younger and myself and in, in the play and um, Eartha Kitt, you know, the, the, the great um, cabaret glam sister superstar went to the play and wrote to her about you know, how moving the play, play was, but also um, superstar white um, 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 Broadway actors like Anne Bancroft, um, everyday white teenagers who were interested in and, and wanted to become involved in the civil rights movement. She kept all of those letters. So, you know, sitting at the table and paying attention not only to the letters th themselves, but the ways that she had organized them and cared for them, you know, as a part of her life world, um, it, it kept me going in the sense of I wanted to, I wanted to just hold for a minute, minute, the kind of the magic of Lorraine Hansberry being in the room with me in that way. And, um, you know, very, very reverentially, 
but carefully paying attention to the fact that a whole life was lived through those letters and those papers that happened with Sora Neale Hurston as well, who, you know, was off the chain. I mean, she, she had beefs with everybody, you know, and <laughs> spending time with all those letters that she was writing about how much she hated poor game bass and how Alan Ooh. Lomax, her fellow folk ethnographer owed her money for, you know, instruments that they, you know, had purchased in their field work. It just was about being um, in the space of aliveness with the objects and with the worlds that they inhabited. And that kept me going. In fact, I always felt um, a, a kind of um, mournfulness and had a little bit of grief whenever I finished my archival um, research trips because, um, you know, the magic of those worlds and those peoples being alive in those papers was, was coming to an end. And honestly, you know, thank you again for asking that question, because in this moment, I can think now about how I think some of that grief translated into um, a kind of um, passion and urgency in how I was writing about what I was finding. Yeah, I think this ties into my next um, question, where it was, I really um, loved how you said, you didn't just touch these objects and letters and things and pamphlets. You did it with gloves off, like, and I know this from working with Christina, who's like a printmaker by trade. You don't touch paper with your bare right. hands. <laughs> don't tell any money, Courtney. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a little bit figurative there. I will say, right? Like, when gloves are off, it it's. I'm glad that you brought that up because I did mean for it to kind of to to signify a slightly competitive posturing. You know, mm -hmm. because I'm fighting with the institutions that have made it such that we've had to do this digging for black women's lives, you know, these institutions that are standing in the way of us, either knowing more about this history or being able to respect the privacy of these people. Um, so it's a little bit like, you know, gloves are off now because there's an urgency to trying to get this history down for the record. And to also, you know, recognize the, the the violence of of this history that made it such that it's been so hard to even come into fuller consciousness about um, the struggles and trials and tribulations of, of what Black people have endured across the centuries. Love it. You put it so beautifully. I also love when you say gloves off, um, say you're also talking about that touching and be touched yeah. is there anything that really like you took with you that you just can't put down like you went down down deep into the archive mm -hmm. you know and you when you say gloves up it's almost like you open yourself up to learn something new mm -hmm. um you know learn a little bit deeper about these musicians but also is there something that touched you that you just like stuck to you that you just can't put down just yet oh my goodness Again, just another, another beautiful question. Um, you know, I, I, a scene that I return to again and again and again and again and again, which is a kind of narrative in the book that I keep returning to, is the jazz musician Cecile McLaurin Salvant's half hour performance of one song, Jelly Roll Morton's um, murder ballad which is famously one of the most profane, I mean, and I'm talking about, I don't know, who would we, who would, I don't know. Y'all are gonna have to help me out with it. Like who is, who is the rawest right now on the scene? Um, match it any, any time with Murder Ballad, which, um, you know, Jelly Roll Morton recorded in the 1930s before he died um, for Alan Lomax, the white ethnographer, um, this is a recording that is stored in the Library of Congress, and it tells a story of, you know, two lovers, African-American, and then a love triangle, another sister gets involved, one sister murders the other sister, so real serious hardcore stuff. She, is, of course, sent to, sent, to, sent to jail, but then finds queer love um, behind bars and um, kind of reimagines her own sense of selfhood and redemption um, by way of queer intimacy. Now, this is Jelly Roll Morden's jam. 
Um, but Cecile McLaurin Savant, who sounds like, you know, any of the like, you know, classic jazz singers, Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Vaughn, um, you name it. I mean, she she sounds quite a bit like all of them and yet sounds completely like herself. So she takes that really mellifluous sound um, and and gives us like the most profane, you know, most graphically violent, like blues narrative, one of the most known to man. Um, and watching her perform that for this nearly all white audience at Lincoln Center and just not giving a thousand F's, you know, <laughs> and yet also giving a thousand F's. Um, it's, it's something, it's a performance I return to all the time because of its bravery, because of its risk, because of its invention, because of its, um, you know, the, the kind of stamina of duration, you know, sing a song for 30 minutes and to be able to ring the lyrics you know, that often repeat um, to, um, you know, yield all sorts of different meanings. Um, I come back to that because it's a reminder of just like the depths of invention and transformation that, you know, Black artists and Black women artists in particular have found recourse in through the music, what it means to survive through music, right? You can constantly reinvent yourself through improvisation. Um, and, you know, I think um, for folks who are outside of the Black radical music tradition, um, they, they, they don't understand that that's about life and death for Black people, right? That, that those skills of improvisation that you hear in the music, you know, are also writ large and at the foundation of, of how we still hear after, you know, um, you know, 400 years plus of subjugation and, and, and attempts to annihilate us. Um, it's all in the music. So if I carry anything, it's that philosophy um, that can be found in um, Cecile's performance and all of the performances and recordings um, in, in the book that, that I loved so much. I feel like we, we as a people have this knack for sort of sending each other coded messages that other people might not even register or hear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I really got into jazz music a few years ago, like listening to mm -hmm. these old like Art Blakey records. Oh, wow. Yes. And um, I remember like at the beginning, just trying to familiarize myself with some of these records I had collected. Mm -hmm. And it didn't take long for me to sit there for a minute and say, I think these instruments are talking to each other, like in a way that right other people might not pick up. Like I'm hearing a yes. conversation here in the jazz. Um, yes. And I was like, oh man, we do that everywhere. Um, <laughs> it's just a cool, a cool thing that we seem to be able it's to do. It's true, we do it everywhere. Do. Yeah. <laughs> but it is, it's about, it's about, it's about survival. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've had to remind my fancy colleagues at Yale and like the Department of English and other you know, powerful units on campus when they when they think we're just talking about African American literature, I have to remind them that the literature came from a bid to survive, you know, mm -hmm. Frederick Douglass wrote his narrative to try and get black people out of chains. So the stakes are always so high when it comes to black art. And it's why I really wanted to pay tribute to um, the sisters making art, but also the sisters and some of the white allies in the book that I write about, like um, mm -hmm. Ellen Willis and the great um, blues entrepreneur, blues record label entrepreneur and, and um, second wave feminist critic Rosetta Wrights, they, they understood that it, it was absolutely necessary to be able to write about and revalue um, the, the, the stakes of, of the art itself, the music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this brings me to my next one. You said on page four, modern popular music culture would cease to exist in the ways that we've come to know it without Black women artists. Absolutely. And you talked about, um, you know, some of the pushback you get from your Yale colleagues. Has anybody tried to push back at you for that <laughs> statement? Because that's a strong statement. You know, mm -hmm. I'm so glad that you that you mentioned that. And it's interesting because I haven't had any pushback about that line. I do feel like we're in, we're definitely, I don't even feel that we are, I wanna affirm that we are in a renaissance of 
um, new works asserting um, that very point um, from a variety of different vantage points. So everybody should watch out for the great um, R&B and pop music critic and journalist and editor Danielle Smith's book. Um, she's got a podcast that is gorgeous, Black, so Black Girl Songbook, and her book that's um, connected to the podcast, Shine Bright, comes out in September. Maureen Mann's Black Diamond Queens about African American women and rock and roll, also making this point. Um, it, you know, the great Farrah Jasmine Griffin 20 years ago wrote the first Black feminist study of Billie Holiday. If you can't be free, be a mystery in search of Billie Holiday. Gail Wald's book on Sister Rosetta Tharp, Shout, Sister Shout, makes this point, right? Um, so I do feel like we're in a moment where we're getting to make these claims. Jaina Brown has a great book about Afrofuturism and sisters um, that just came out as well. Um, what I have encountered, I had a, I had an experience um, right around the time when the book came out, a white male blues critic wrote on um, his Facebook page that a New York Times article that I wrote last August to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Mamie Smith's Crazy Blues, the first blues recording by an African-American in 1920, which launched the blues craze, the blues, blues record craze, I should say, the blues craze long preceded the blues record craze. Um, but I wrote about um, the anniversary through the prism of thinking about Black women and um, girls as fans, and my mother, who we've talked about already, um, and you know the now defunct reboot of High Fidelity with Zoe Kravitz, and um, you know trying to think about how central we've been to loving the music in addition to making the music. And he posted on Facebook that he thought that it was an inaccurate article because I couldn't prove that black women and girls um, loved Mamie Smith's um, recording. And I thought, you know, I, I literally thought, well, you know, this book wasn't written for you, but it's all about you, you know, as Carly Simon sings and you're so vain, because, you know, the whole point of the argument that I'm making in the book is that we are completely invisible to you know these kinds of people um, and our invisibility is a socio-political and historical crisis it, it comes from socio-political historical iniquities and violence you know the fact that you can't find us or you can't even imagine that we existed in history um, so i've gotten i've gotten that kind of pushback and it's actually been helpful it's been a teachable moment as oprah would say so uh, why am I so insistent upon giving out to them that blackness, that black power, that black pushing them to identify with uh, 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 black culture? I think that's what you're asking. It's, it's, I have no choice over it. In the first place, to me, we are the most beautiful creatures in the whole world, black people. I mean, and I mean that in every, every sense, uh, outside and inside. And to me, we have a culture that uh, is surpassed by, 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 by no other civilization, but we don't know anything about it. So again, I think I've said this before in the same interview, I think uh, at some time before, my, my job is to somehow make them curious enough or persuade them by hook or crook to get more aware of themselves and where they came from and what they are into and what is already there and just to bring it out. This is what compels me to compel them. And I will do it by whatever means necessary. Continuing with what you all were talking about as we look at the music being created now, I was curious, Daphne, if you had thoughts on how people could best support um, the black women musicians out there mm. today. Yeah. Oh God, you guys just ask the best questions. I mean, this is just <laughs> like, these are questions I never get asked. You know, I mean, obviously, financially sustaining their careers is important, and you know, streaming makes it harder. The pandemic makes it harder. You know, um, so there's that material support. Um, I think my book is really 
trying to make an argument for how important it is to hold spaces in which we we care for the music through our own creative forms of expression and your generation has done that so brilliantly you know through digital platforms through the gram you know and and twitter and 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 different hives and and, and fan bases um I, I do feel like you know we're in a moment in which um the sociality of the digital world allows for a, a kind of expansion of critical care for these artists um that we haven't been able to experience before you know i say at the close of the book that lemonade is you know arguably i don't even think arguably the most reviewed album of all time um if we count and we should the everyday you know, bloggers and folks who were posting on multiple platforms about their ideas about the album. Um, and I think that's important because it democratizes criticism. I think critics are important because we, at our best, we can and should operate as ethical ears, you know, for communities and bridge figures to allow us to continue conversations with art that we have strong feelings about. We shouldn't be gatekeepers, although historically the white men who've been critics often have been. You know, some of these sisters, like I write about the blues women, Gishi, Wiley, and Alvy Thomas, we, we really don't know why they disappeared. But, you know, I experiment with a number of different scenarios that have to do with Jim Crow racism and sexism and homophobia. But it's quite possible, too, that we want to hold on to the fact that they wanted to be private with their art, you know. Um, what I hope that we can do um, is to expand the number of possibilities um, for how and when and in what way we encounter and regard and take seriously Black women's work, and that that should come through our ability to share the music with each other. Thank you for that. I I've been really inspired lately by that High on the Hog series on Netflix. Oh my God, it's so great. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. and what I liked about it, and also this conversation, is this uh, creating these opportunities where you can say there are different lenses to which you can try and explore Black history. Right. You can explore through music or through food or through textiles or poetry or all these different things, because we can say that we know African-Americans touched all of these different creative yes, outlets. That's right. Yes. Um, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's something really powerful in that of like people finding mm -hmm. like what mode are they perhaps most comfortable learning about history through but then i also think about the multi-sensory possibilities of being in a space where you're getting some of the food the cuisine seeing yeah. artwork seeing the poetry and the live yeah. music yes that's <laughs> like right. that's right. what if yes. there was yeah. a spot where mm -hmm. i'm sure they exist somewhere um oh. i'm being too general but just thinking of spaces <laughs> like that world festival <laughs> there you go. Well, you guys have to keep doing this kind of work. I mean, that's exactly what should be happening. Um, yeah. We should be able to build these spaces for and with each other. Absolutely. Yes. Only last thing ah. I wanted to say was um, there is a playlist on Spotify. I found it. Playlist yes. by the same name of the book. Um, with artists that were mentioned in the book, but going beyond that, like Bessie Smith, the Shipwreck Blues, Toulon, Aretha Franklin, Billie Holiday, Janelle Monet, Eartha Kitt, they're all on there crossing space and time. So thank you. Thank you for that <laughs> shout out. And I want to, I want to thank my, my assistants who helped me not only with the playlist, but with you know, conceptual things in the book. Nate Young was one of my editors who thought up the side A and the side B. Amy Dupoy put the playlist together. Von Trong right. arranged for a lot of my interviews with Cicel McLaurin Savant and Rihanna Giddens and Valerie June. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I say this in closing 
because I also believe in collaboration and I believe in the work of the ensemble. Um, my dear friend, the MacArthur genius philosopher, Fred Moden, um, has famously said that a soloist is is not a self. If you're a soloist, you are always, you know, connected to the ensemble, right? You step out um, in order to assert your individualism, but that, that also comes from your robust conversations with the ensemble. And mm -hmm. I see that and hear that with the both of you, you know, this is a kind of duet, right? I, I write about <laughs> duets in the book too. And you know, duetting is something that we need to be able to do ethically to hold each other other up, to sustain each other, to grow from each other. And, and you know, let's keep build, building these communities where we can listen to and celebrate and, and care for the genius of Black women's um, artistry, right? Um, together yes. in collaboration with one another. Yes. Well, thank you, Daphne. You guys, you guys are the best. <laughs> thank you.